Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm Kayla Hooven with Foley & Lardner. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's web conference titled, Give Me a C for Copyright. High Court Says Decorative Elements of Cheerleading Uniforms Copyrightable. Today's presenters are Laura Ganoza and Julie McGinnis. Laura, Laura is a partner and litigation lawyer with Foley & Lardner. She primarily represents business clients including clients in the fashion and apparel industry in a wide range of complex commercial litigation matters, including but not limited to cross-border disputes, trade secret and non-compete actions, as well as a variety of intellectual property litigation matters, including trademark, copyright, and patent infringement matters. Laura has found success combining her litigation and IP experience on behalf of her clients. In addition to enforcing and litigating her clients' valuable rights, Laura manages the trademark and copyright portfolios for a wide range of clients and advises clients about how to obtain, maintain, and protect their intellectual property rights, both domestically and internationally. Julie McGinnis is an associate in intellectual property attorneys with Foley & Lardner. She provides counsel to clients on trademark and copyright law matters including clearance, portfolio management, prosecution, licensing, risk management, defense, and enforcement. She also assists, assists clients with the purchase or sale of intellectual property assets. Julie has experience with proceedings before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, actions and administrative proceedings involving domain names and trademark and copyright infringement cases in federal court. Before I turn the presentation over to our speakers, I would like to go over a few house housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour, followed by a short question and answer session. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Please type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the presentation window, which is designated with the question mark icon. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at fully.com in the next few days, or you can get a copy of the slides in the resource list widget. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will also be available on Foley's website in the next few days. And now I'd like to turn our presentation over to Laura and Julie. Thanks so much, Kayla. And thank you everyone for attending. This is Laura Ganoza, and I'm pleased to be with you today. Um, as some of you may know, this is a follow-up to a webinar that we did back on November 10th following oral arguments that took place before the Supreme Court in the Star Athletica versus Varsity Brands case. So we've been waiting for several months at this long-awaited decision to see what implications this cheerleading apparel case could have on the larger fashion industry. And then finally, on March 22nd, the Supreme Court finally announced its decision in the Star Athletica case Incidentally, right in the middle of when at least I, and I suspect several of other of you on the call, were at a fashion conference uh, that was taking place in New York. So I'm sure all of us lawyers were glued to our devices trying to get the download on this decision that hit in the middle of our conference. But at least now we have some clarity in that the decision gives us a standard for testing whether a feature of a useful article is protectable under the Copyright Act. And this was a question that had been plaguing many of us practitioners for a long time because there were no less than 10 tests out there that the prior court in the Sixth Circuit was dealing with. So finally, we get some clarity. A new test is announced. And for those that practice in the area, we can breathe a sigh of relief in that there's not been a per se ruling that just because something, some design is on a piece of clothing, it's not capable of copyright protection. So, so that's a good thing. So today we're going to talk about 
what the decision says, and how it could be applied going forward. So first, we have to talk about how, how this, what really is the focus of this decision. And the focus of this decision really is on the definitions in the definition section of the Copyright Act. We start with first the definition of what's a pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work. And then when those kinds of works are incorporated into useful articles, such as clothing. So we're starting with the statute. And the statute actually says that these types of works are two-dimensional, three-dimensional three -dimensional works of art, applied art, photographs, things of that nature. Those kinds of works include works of artistic craftsmanship, in so far as their form, but not their mechanical or utilitarian aspects are concerned. And for our purposes, this is the most important part of this statute, that the design of a useful article shall be considered a pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work only if and only to the extent that such design incorporates pictorial, graphic, or sculptural features that can be identified separately from and are capable of existing independently of the utilitarian aspects of the article. So this, this part of the statute is really what we're talking about in this case. When can you separate a design that's put on clothing to determine its copyrightability? And that's what the Supreme Court was trying to tackle. Using this statute, their task was to determine whether the zigzag chevrons and colorful shapes that, are, that appear on the uniforms used in these cheerleading outfits were protectable under copyright because they are separable features of the design of those uniforms. So let's just have a little brief history of how we got this case involving cheerleader uniforms got all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Julie, why don't you give us some background that got us here to where we are today? Sure. Thanks, Laura. And thanks, everyone uh, who is listening in for joining us today. Um, so for those of you uh, that need a refresher or for those of you who might be unfamiliar with the factual background of this case, uh, as we've discussed, this case is about cheerleading uniforms. Uh, Varsity Brands is the plaintiff in this case. It is actually a holding company for a number of cheerleading-related subsidiaries. Um, one of which manufactures cheerleading uniforms. Um, Varsity Brands is a very large company. Uh, they have over 9,000 employees, and they were actually acquired a few years ago for $1.5 billion. So this is big business for them. Uh, Varsity Brands sued a competitor, Star Athletica, uh, claiming that Star had copied five of Varsity Brands' cheerleading uniform designs, uh, for which they had obtained registrations with the Copyright Office. So as Laura mentioned, the designs at issue included different arrangements of stripes, chevrons, zigzags, color blocks. Um, we have some examples of those to review with you. Um, just These are from uh, the deposit materials uh, which were registered with the Copyright Office. So as you can see, we've got a couple of dress designs, um, different presentations of chevrons and stripes. There were also some uh, cheerleading tops some separates that had these sort of zigzag patterns and kind of crisscrossing lines. Um, and so, you know, they had claimed that uh, Star Athletica had copied these designs. Um, we have some examples. The, the top is uh, from Star Athletica's catalog, and the bottom is a comparison to uh, Varsity Brands registration. So as you can see, um, they claimed, hey, you've copied our designs that we've registered with the Copyright Office. Um, so the district court uh, actually held that the designs at issue were not eligible for copyright protection. Um, it held that the, the designs were those of useful articles, these pieces of clothing, and therefore that Varsity Brands was, uh, did not ha did, they were not able to get a copyright for, for those materials. So the, they appealed to the Sixth Circuit. The Sixth Circuit reversed, holding that uh, the designs were copyrightable because they could be identified separately from uh, and existed independently of the utilitarian aspect of a cheerleading uniform, that is, the structural design of you know, the dress or the top or what have you. So um, 
Star Athletica appealed to the Supreme Court um, asking two questions. First is, what is the test? Uh, what, is the, what is the proper test to use to determine when a feature is protected by copyright? Um, and the second question is, what level of deference should you give to the Copyright Office's decision to issue a registration uh, when there is a useful article at stake? So the court uh, granted the cert petition as to the first question. Um, and, uh, and left the deference question, left the deference question alone. So before we discuss the court's opinion, it's sort of important to discuss what this case is not about, just for clarity. Um, this, the, the court's opinion does not address whether the copyrights are actually valid. There are some additional requirements for validity, which we will talk about later. Um, it also doesn't decide that there was uh, infringement. Um, infringement requires that you have ownership of a valid copyright and that there be actionable copyright or actionable copying. Um, that means um, that the portions that were copied were the portions that were entitled to copyright protection. So the court's opinion doesn't go so far as to uh, as to decide those things. So leading up to the court's decision um, and what the Sixth Circuit wrestled with in its uh, in its opinion. Uh, was this plethora of tests that were used for conceptual separability. Historically, uh, the courts have used a distinction between physical and conceptual separability when analyzing uh, useful articles. So physical separability is, you know, can you physically remove the object from the useful article and have it retain its pictorial, sculptural, or graphic elements? The classic examples of this are something like a hood ornament or a lamp base. If you take the hood ornament off the car, it can still be a sculpture that would be entitled to copyright protection. So the Sixth Circuit identified this number of tests. We're aware of at least 10 of them um, that the different circuits and the Copyright Office have used to address conceptual separability, which is um, whether you can conceptually remove the pictorial, graphic, or sculptural elements from the useful article, even if you can't just remove them like you could a hood ornament off, off of the roof of a car. Um, so the, the court was reviewing the, this plethora of tests, and the Sixth Circuit had actually arrived at its own test. Um, we won't review that test because the Supreme Court has now announced its own. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Laura um, to talk about what the court decided in this case. Thanks, Julie. So we got a decision that was authored by Judge Thomas. And one thing to know about Judge Thomas is that he's a strict constructionist. That means that he's going to be looking to the language of the statute and going by the language of the statute. So if he doesn't find that the, there's intent specifically written into the statute, he's not going to find it elsewhere. So starting with that, he rendered a decision, and it was joined by five other members of the court, and there was a two-member dissent, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, and the decision gave us what looks like a pretty straightforward two-part test. The ruling is that this is how you determine if something is copyrightable as a design on a useful article. First, it has to be perceived as a two- or three-dimensional work of art separate from the useful article. And second, it has to qualify as a protectable pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work either on its own or in some other medium if imagined separately from the useful article. So this is a two-part test. And he says the first part should be easy. You look at it, and it should be relatively easy to spot if there are features that are pictorial, sculptural, some kind of design element in nature. And he says, in this case, it's pretty easy to see if you're looking at this design that the chevrons, the stripes, the zigzags, that's the two-dimensional work of art that you can identify. So that's the first part. That's the easier part. The second part is, can it be imagined separately from the article? So that's going to be our new standard. Lawyers are going to be writing briefs 
that are going to say, well, this design you can imagine separately from this article of clothing or this other kind of industrial product. So that's going to be the key word, imagine separately. And it's interesting to note, and this goes back to the type of justice that Justice Thomas, it, Thomas is, it's very clear in the opinion that he said this is not a free-ranging search for what's the best copyright policy we should have for the fashion industry. He was not looking at it in this way. Instead, he says that this decision and this case depends solely on statutory interpretation. So he looked at the statute and said he came up with this. And so how did he do that? So what he did was he looked at the rest of the statute because as a strict constructionist, he's going to look at what the exact language is of the statute and what surrounds it. What does the rest of the statute say? So he took a look at another section of the Copyright Act, Section 106, which gives the exclusive rights to a copyright owner and says that a copyright owner has the exclusive right to reproduce his or her work in any medium whether it's useful or not. So the court finds you have a piece of art, like for example, I'm in Miami and we have a local artist who's ubiquitous down here, Romero Brito. His artwork is on everything. It starts off on canvas, but he puts his art on everything, mugs, t-shirts, I mean literally anything you can imagine and you'll find it here in his stores and elsewhere. So the Copyright Act gives a copyright owner that exclusive right. You start out one way, but you have the right to reproduce it in any other way, any other medium, including even a useful article like a t-shirt or a mug. So Judge Thomas says, well, Section 101, which talks about designs on useful articles, is the mirror image of that. So it's just because you put something on clothing first, doesn't mean that it loses its protection. So he wrote in the opinion, and this is a pretty strong statement, that the copyright protection will extend to these pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works regardless of whether they were creating as, created as freestanding art or as features of useful article. And that's really important because it does make sure that there is not this bright line rule that merely because you have a certain design and you choose to put it on an article of clothing or something that's useful, that doesn't automatically exclude it from being eligible for copyright protection. So that's a pretty important statement. Another important uh, statement that's made in this opinion that could be used going forward is that the element of the artist artistic feature would be eligible for copyright protection, that would be protectable, would be eligible for copyright protection on its own, can't lose that just because it was part of the design and even if it makes that article more useful. Again, this is really important because one of the arguments that that Star Athletica was trying to make in the case is that if the designs have any kind of ability to add to the usefulness of the article, then it cannot be protected by copyright. And I don't know if uh, any of you actually read the transcripts of some of the oral arguments that took place before the Supreme Court, but one of the issues that came up was, you know, sometimes designers put in elements of their designs that have the effect of making the woman's body look a certain way. And they actually used Kate Winslet. I'm sure she was thrilled that her name was thrown around in an oral argument in the Supreme Court talking about her body shape. But that was one of the discussions that were had. Well, in that case, in the discussion that was made, well, the, the way the dress was designed and some of the color blocking of that dress had the illusion to make her thinner, maybe even taller. So it did serve a useful article. This Supreme Court decision is saying, well, just because you have a design that does that, that doesn't disqualify them automatically from having copyright protection. And it really takes you back to the fact that it really doesn't matter in what medium this design is featured on. And one of these points is driven home by Judge Justice Ginsburg. She actually authored a concurring opinion. And her concurring opinion was really just focused on, you know what, guys? 
we don't even really have to get to all of this stuff. Let's look at what the copyright registration says and how these articles first appeared or how these designs first appeared in the first place. And she says in many of the cases the designs were actually sketches on paper and they weren't even on the physical, on the clothing or the uniform itself. So she's saying even take a step back and look, look, these weren't even on clothing, so we don't even be we don't even need to be having this discussion. So what happens when you attempt to imagine these designs separate from the clothes? How do we actually get there? And the court ruling wants you to, they say that imaginatively removing the surface decorations from the uniform and applying them in another medium would not replicate the uniform itself. So this, these are a couple of examples of when you can actually separate something, some design, and that doesn't automatically mean that you're making another uniform or you're, you're just making the same thing um, look uh, it, in the same way. So for example, in this instance, so you have a painting on one side. That same painting could be applied to a dress, and it looks that way. And then the same thing is then later could be applied to a to that uniform. And they all are different, and it doesn't mean that you're not capable of protection just because it's on a piece of clothing. So he keeps he reemphasizes that. And I think in doing this, he addresses an important point that's raised from uh, that's raised by the dissent. Because Justice Breyer in the dissent says, well, if I take away all these chevrons and I put them, I take them out of what it looks like in the cheerleading uniform and I just put them somewhere else, I'm still going to have the outline of this cheerleading uniform. And Justice Thomas, in his opinion, says, well, it doesn't really matter because what you're saying then is you're then just limiting it because of the actual contour of what the uniform looks like. If you take it right off of there and you put it in something else, of course it's going to have that same shape and outline of a top and a skirt. But that in and of itself doesn't mean that you can't still protect it. And he uses an example of if you do a design on the surface of a guitar, for example, so you have this nice guitar and you put a piece of artwork, you actually draw some art or put a design on the surface of, of the guitar. If you put it on a portion of the guitar, you, you're able to separate that, put that on a piece of paper, it's going to look a certain way, just a design. But if you have the artwork take up the entire guitar, you paint the entire guitar, and then you remove that, put that on a piece of paper, of course that's going to look like a, the shape of a guitar. Justice Thomas says just because it does that doesn't mean that that then becomes a guitar that you can't protect. So it actually opens up, it opens up the playing field a little more because you're not really limited in just what the actual outline of the shape looks like. So he recognizes that fact. And in doing that, he actually did away with one of the tests that had been used a lot of times by the Copyright Office and by many courts, which is one that Julie had raised at the beginning, the uh, physical versus conceptual distinction. And Julie, maybe you can go back and explain that, what he did in removing that. Sure. Um, so as we're as you mentioned, you know, it sort of abandons this distinction between physical and conceptual separability. So really the only thing that we're going to look at is conceptual separability. Historically, courts had kind of done this sort of two-step test of saying, well, first let's look and see if we can physically separate it. If it's physically separable, we'll stop there, and we don't have to assess whether there's conceptual separability. So the court's really saying we, we, we really just want to look at conceptual separability. Um, so again, going back to the classic example of physical separability is, you know, this hood ornament on the car. Um, a, an example from a, a case a few years ago of conceptual separability is the Giovanni fashion case, which involved these design elements of this sort of prom homecoming dress. Um, and the, the question, the analysis of whether 
the ruching and the beating and sequins and the and the tool whether those things and the way that they are configured on the dress could be conceptually separated. Um, so really the court is now folding the physical separability component into the conceptual separability test. Now, if something is actually physically separable, that might make it easier to identify that something is conceptually separable because you can, um, it, it, it may be mentally easier to remove those elements from the useful article. Um, but the point is that we're not really doing this two-step analysis, and by doing that, the court is trying to um, trying to really identify that items that wouldn't be subject to the physical separability test are not are not you know subject to more scrutiny. Um, it's it's that you have to you you really have to look at those features regardless of whether they're physically separable or not. Um, and that seems to be really what the court is is talking about. So in talking about those those features, I'll you know turn it back to you, Laura, um, to talk about sort of what we do with those extracted features. Right. And so what the court says is, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens once you remove those features. Because one of the arguments that Star Athletica was trying to make to the court was that, okay, you have this cheerleading uniform with these stripes and chevrons. If you take that away, take all of those colors away, all you're left with is a plain white garment, a V-neck shirt, a little skirt, and that's no longer identified as a cheerleading uniform. But the court said that doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. When you're doing this test to imagine this design separately, you have to focus on what you are removing only and whether they qualify, not what happens to the actual garment or article after you remove it. So this is very important because it rejects this notion that Star Athletica was trying to argue that, that a copyright can only extend to something that is solely artistic. And if it serves any purpose at all, any useful purpose at all, there would not be entitled to copyright protection. Judge Thomas, Justice Thomas says no, he, and how does he do? He goes back to the statute and says the statute doesn't require you to remove the feature such that the resulting article is still useful in a certain way or not. It doesn't matter what happens after you remove it. The statute just wants you, requires you to remove it and then evaluate that. The result of what happens to the article itself doesn't matter. So that's another very important element of this case, and it's something we should think about in how we're going to ultimately render or ultimately argue if something is separable under the statute. Now, a couple of other things. A couple of other things that the court did is they rejected a couple of the other factors that Star Athletica wanted wanted to be included in this analysis. So one of the things that was argued is, okay, well, to determine if a design is capable of having copyright protection, we should really look at certain factors like whether the elements reflect the designer's artistic judgment, regardless of uh, the functionality. So that would make it so that evidence of why the designer chose to do certain things? What was their purpose? What was the reason behind putting those designs? That would all become relevant. For example, the, the, the contouring lines uh, in that Kate Winslet dress, why a designer wanted to do that, something like that would become relevant. The court said, no, we're not gonna, that's not a factor that we're going to consider in this analysis. We're not going to be asking designers why they did this, why they chose not to do that. That's not something we need to ask in determining whether a design is copyrightable. Another, another point or factor that was being advocated was, well, does this feature, would it be marketable without its utilitarian feature? So that would actually require to look into, okay, how valuable is this particular design, design element to the marketability of this particular product? So then you're going to be dealing with market surveys to determine if a consumer is 
purchasing something because of this particular design and the function that it brings to the article. Again, the court said no, which maybe is a sigh of relief. So now we don't have to go out there and hire a bunch of survey experts that have to deal with market evidence of, of the value of a particular feature for a design. So those two elements, they said no. And in making this analysis, the court wanted to be clear that they don't want to be judging um, what is artistic over one form of another. They don't want it to be the judge's responsibility or ultimately maybe even the judge's to determine if something is you know, truly artistic in that way or it's truly something that it is that has that market appeal. So they rejected those. And instead, it's this two-part test. Now, unfortunately, they, they rejected those things of like what you don't consider, and, but they didn't go into much detail on, okay, well then how do you consider when something is that you can imagine it separately from? They don't go into a lot of those factors. In fact, it's kind of just a cursory response they, the, the end result or the basic holding is that since the designs on the surface of these uh, cheerleading uniforms, they meet the two-part test because first of all, there is a feature that they can see, those two-dimensional designs, and, and they satisfy the requirement that they can be imagined separately. And so they just, they just made the holding that they can be. And, that, and because of that, they affirm the Sixth Circuit decision. Now, um, so it, it doesn't give us a lot of help in how you get there. We know how we don't need to get there, but I wish personally there had been a little bit more guidance as to how it is we are to conduct that test. Um, now, points raised by the dissent, though, really cause us to think, okay, how is this test going to be applied and what really will be the ultimate outcome for, uh, for clothing designs or how this will be decided in the future? And Julie's going to go over the dissent and uh, what was held with that. Sure. So um, Justice Breyer authored the dissent, which was joined by uh, Justice Kennedy. Now, Breyer actually seems to agree with a lot of the court's opinion insofar as the test that they've announced and the analysis of the statute. However, he disagrees with their conclusion, and so um, he would find that the designs were not copyrightable. Um, a big part of the dissent's argument is that, uh, look, these pictures, these drawings, are pictures of cheerleading uniforms. And so they replicate the cheerleading uniform, the garment, which is a useful article and therefore can't be protectable. Um, you know, he, he, he says that a picture of the design features is a picture of the useful article. You, it's, it's not something different. And so what he's saying is that if, if, if you're extracting the design elements and when you do that, you bring along the underlying useful articles. So if by extracting the zigzags and chevrons and color blocks of the cheerleading uniform, you are necessarily bringing along the useful article itself, then the design is not separable and therefore uh, is not eligible for copyright protection. He points out that the courts and the Copyright Office have a long-standing practice of holding that um, you can copyright a photo or a painting of an object. So if I paint a bowl of fruit, then I can have a copyright in my painting that I have painted of the bowl of fruit. But I can't use that copyright to prevent someone from replicating this bowl of fruit in real life um, or of you know, painting their own picture of a different bowl of fruit or maybe even the same bowl of fruit. Um, and so to illustrate this, Breyer applies the test that the court has just announced, and uh, you know, he comes to a different result. So first he says, you know, you, okay, we're going to imaginatively remove these design elements as they're shown in this drawing, uh, and as they're arranged on you know, the neckline, the, you know, the V-neck, the waistline, the, the sleeves, the skirt pleats of each uniform, and we're going to apply those elements to a painter's canvas, and look, now what I've painted is a cheerleader's dress. And therefore, I have not separated, I can't separate any of this. 
and uh, therefore I can't have a copyright in my cheerleading dress designs. So he also points out that courts have um, denied copyright to a number of design elements that are kind of incorporated into a useful article. Some of the examples he highlights are um, measuring spoons that are shaped like heart-tipped arrows or candle holders that were shaped like sailboats or uh, a certain pattern or arrangement of wire spokes on the wheel, uh, a wheel cover for a vehicle. So he says you can't conceptualize these things without also seeing spoons and candle holders and and wheels. So therefore, you can't separate them. So he uses this example of uh, this famous Van Gogh painting of a pair of shoes. Well, Van Gogh could have a copyright, theoretically, in his painting of the shoes, but he can't prevent someone from manufacturing a pair of shoes by his copyright in this painting. And he says the same thing should apply in this case to this dress, uh, to the, you know, these these cheerleading uniform designs, that yes, you can get a copyright in your illustration of these designs, but you can't use that to prevent somebody from, uh, from, from making the dress itself because it is a useful article. And so, um, you know, now uh, this dissent really illustrates that uh, we can expect the courts to wrestle with this quite a bit going forward. Um, obviously, as Laura mentioned, the Supreme Court didn't really give very specific guidance. They usually don't in this case when they announce a test. They don't always give a lot of guidance on how to interpret that test. They leave it to the lower courts in order to do that. Um, so that's not totally a surprise, though we would have liked to have uh, received a little more guidance. So now what we need to do is look and see what happens in this case going forward, uh, because we're not really done here with the court's decision. So um, what's going to happen next is that this uh, case has been remanded back to the district court. Uh, the district court now with this new uh, Supreme Court test in hand and this, and this determination that the designs at issue are eligible for copyright, they actually need to look at whether Varsity Brands copyright is valid. Um, there are some prerequisites and other things which we won't talk about, but one of the key things that the district court is going to be looking at and which the parties are going to probably heavily brief and argue about, is whether and to what extent Varsity Brands designs are actually original. Or originality is a requirement uh, to establish a valid copyright. Um, as many of us know, uh, under the Feist case and the line of cases that follow, um, the bar for originality is fairly low. Um, it's very low. It, it merely means that something was independently created as opposed to copied from someone else and that there is some minimal degree of creativity. That minimal degree, degree of creativity um, is exactly that. It's pretty minimal. Um, so now in evaluating this and also in evaluating the second prong of the infringement analysis of whether there was actionable copyright or actionable copying, there are a number of judicial doctrines that are probably going to come into play here that the parties are going to argue about um, that could limit the scope of Varsity Brands copyright, if any, in these designs. Um, those are the doctrines of uh, public domain, of merger, and sans affaire. Um, I'm not going to talk about each of those in detail, but essentially they're um, judicial doctrines and, and tests that the courts use to sort of extract out certain features for certain reasons, um, chiefly because to not remove those things from the copyright would prevent others from using them, and, and for a variety of reasons, we don't want to do that. Um, in this case, the Sens Affair uh, doctrine, for example, I, I would expect that Star Athletica will probably make the argument that look at every cheerleading uniform that's out there. There are stripes, there are chevrons, there are zigzags, there are color blocks. You can't prevent someone from using those items because that's what makes a cheerleading uniform a uniform, and therefore we should be able to use those things. Um, so again, we're going to have to wait and see what the, argument, the arguments that are made and what the lower court ultimately decides as far as the scope of Varsity Brands copyright. Um, if they are able to establish a valid copyright, 
the Supreme Court made it really clear in their opinion that that copyright can only be used to prohibit the reproduction of those designs in a, a tangible medium of expression. That could be in a cheerleading uniform, it could be applied to a lunchbox or um, a, a, a track jacket or a tote bag or you know whatever or a, a painter's canvas, whatever uh, whatever other medium. They really drove home that the copyright cannot be used to pro prevent somebody from manufacturing a uniform that has an identical shape and cut and form to the ones on which these designs um, appear. And um, that is really just meant to remind, uh, to remind us all that you cannot use copyright to protect the these sort of structural elements of a useful article. So obviously a cheerleading uniform has to be cut a certain way in order to fit the wearer's body. And so you can't use your copyright in the way the design elements are laid out on the, um, on the dress or on the top to prevent someone from constructing uh, a garment that uh, you know, has the same dimensions and shape. So those are some things to keep in mind. Um, we'll, we will need to continue to watch what happens in this case and also in others for how, uh, how courts will, will continue to apply it. Um, so now, you know, where does that leave us? Um, Laura, I'll let you talk a little bit about what we think this decision means for the industry and, um, you know, where we should go from here. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, and that last point that you made I think is really important because um, both the majority opinion and the dissent both made reference to kind of this limitation and, and made it clear that we are not holding in this case that you can get a copyright on the shape of a garment. And, you know, Justice Breyer was very uh, clear on, you know, the fashion industry has tried for years to try to get more copyright protection. Bills keep failing every time they do it. And yet, nonetheless, the fashion industry is still, still thriving. And so I think to address those issues, Justice Thomas wanted to make sure to say, well, I'm not saying that the, the, the shape of this can be copyrighted. It's just a design element. So we still have that issue that copyright protection, even with this case, is still much more limited in the U.S. than it is abroad, certainly in other places like Europe. And so we, we are still grappling with that, but at least here it gives some indication that some design elements can still be <clears throat> copyrightable under the right circumstances. So, so what, what's good about this decision? Well, one thing is that, you know, we have that sigh of relief. Okay, we have some decision. There is some copyright protection available where you meet this two-part test. And now we have, like, one two-part test. We don't have ten tests all different circuits, people um, trying to deal with it however, um, however they can. We have this simple, what looks to be a simple, straightforward two-part test. One, can you and Matt, can you, is there an actual two-dimensional, three-dimensional design element you could actually point out and see? And if so, can you imagine that separately from the article itself? So the nationwide application, that's going to be our new test. And you know, it'll apply to you know, everything. It's not just limited to clothing or cheerleading designs. Um, this can be used in any other element that's a useful article. You know, it could be maybe uh, tables, chairs, other kinds of useful designs or industrial designs. You see, we'll have to see how that plays out. But to the extent that there are design elements incorporated to other things that are useful, this says that you, as long as they meet that two-part test, you could, it's eligible for copyright protection. And we discussed this a little before. You know, it, it, it accounts for the fact that you do have these constraints when you're working on a design element in a useful article because it's going to take the shape of that article. Whether you're painting a mural on a wall, if the wall is curved or, you know, slanted, it's only going to be that shape. But that, that shouldn't determine whether or not you're entitled to copyright protection, just the dimensions of the surface over which you are applying this design. So that, that clarifies that. Now, a couple of disadvantages, though. Like we said, the opinion is not super clear on how you ultimately apply the test. And in fact, when the same test was applied, different results were reached. 
So that part is gives us some uncertainty, and it could lead to different results. Of And so as of right now, we just checked, I guess, Julie, you checked this morning, um, there have been no decisions that actually cite this case for anything related to this. I think there might have been one case that cited this decision on a procedural issue. But as of right now, we don't have, the, that's been published at least, any uh, lower court decision or any other decision that's actually used this case, interpreted to come to a ruling. So we are just going to have to wait and see. But Julie, now that we have this decision, now we have kind of a landscape of what could be or what is and what's not entitled to copyright protection, and maybe you can explain where we are on that. Sure, sure. So just do a quick review here of kind of some of the previous cases and, and, and design elements that have been talked about where copyright protection has been found. Um, one of the classic cases is the Folio Impressions case, which is the case that says that you can uh, copyright uh, a fabric design, the pattern of a, fa of, a, of a fabric design. So the distinction between this fabric design and the designs at issue here is that the cheerleading uniforms had these sort of strips of fabric that were sewn onto the fabric. If, if it had been you know, printed onto the fabric, we might be you know, looking at a different analysis. Um, but it has long been the case that fabric, the pattern of, of a fabric, uh, the design of that pattern has been copyrightable. Um, another case which is talked about often is the Knit Waves case, which dealt with uh, these sweater designs that had these appliques on them of kind of fall motifs, so leaves and squirrels and things like that. And in that case, the Second Circuit held, well, these appliques and the way that they're arranged on, uh, you know, on these sweaters, um, that, that's copyrightable. Now, this case is actually pretty close to the case at issue here. The distinction is that we're not talking about leaves and squirrels and um, you know, other little appliques. We're talking about chevrons and stripes and things like that. Um, another kind of potential design that was talked about in some of the briefs and also at oral argument is this tuxedo t-shirt. So here we have this drawing of a tuxedo that's applied to a t-shirt and it's, you know, sort of worn as, as sort, of a, um, sort of a joke, like, look, I've got my formal wear on. And the court actually discussed this in oral arguments and the uh, U.S. government uh, talked about this in their amicus brief in holding that this drawing, this design that's applied to the t-shirt is copyrightable. Um, you know, the mere fact that it makes the t-shirt looks like a tuxedo doesn't remove it from, uh, from the realm of copyrightability. Um, so, and now, you know, now we also potentially have these um, stripes and chevrons and, and curved lines and such from our cheerleading uniforms. Um, so, really when you're looking at a design of a garment or of any other useful article, it can kind of help to think, like, is there a is, is our design more like one of these? Um, and, you know, can we classify it that and then therefore make an argument that, you know, our, our design elements are copyrightable? Um, so in a, actually in an ABA webinar recently, um, a representative from the Copyright Office indicated that the Copyright Office will be publishing updated guidance. That guidance is going to appear in the compendium. Um, that does make us think it might take a while before we actually get that guidance. Um, the compendium is only in its third edition, so it doesn't get revised all that often. Um, and so it might take a little bit of time for that guidance to appear. Um, I suspect there's also an approval process before that happens. So right now, all we can really do is look to existing guidance. Um, actually, the current edition of the compendium, um, section 924.3, covers a number of different types of useful articles, and it gives some examples of what the Copyright Office looks for when it is evaluating an application and deposit material um, for whether or not you know, what the applicant is claiming copyright in is copyrightable. Um, there is a subsection on clothing, um, which actually talks about the physical, which you know talks about the kind of e existing landscape prior to this case. But there are also sections that might be useful to look at um, on things like jewelry and costume designs and masks, where you can look at what the Copyright Office is looking 
looking for for those types of things and which types of which types of elements that they would exclude from copyright protection. Um, the la lastly, like Laura said, we do not have any lower court decisions that have applied this new test. Um, and so, you know, keeping an eye out for those, we of course will, will monitor them. And um, the hope is that some pattern emerges for how the courts, you know, how the courts apply this test to different design features of garments and of other useful articles. Um, at, you know, of course, this, the test that the court has announced doesn't just apply to uh, garments or, you know, articles of clothing. It applies to useful the design of useful articles generally. Um, so, you know, that's really the one, the practical things we need to do now is kind of continue to watch and see what the Copyright Office and the courts do. Um, as far as practitioners, Laura, why don't you talk about maybe what, what we as lawyers and, and as um, participants in the fashion industry can, um, can do while we're waiting to get additional guidance? Sure. Yeah, and I think it's important to do that. I think it's important to step back and say, okay, well, let's see. So we have this case out here now that does recognize some design elements, the copyrightability of some design elements of uh, clothing designs. I think it's important to evaluate what your clients or the business folks that you work with, if you're in-house counsel, um, what what is in their portfolio? Is there anything that they have that maybe would be capable of copyright protection now under this under this test. So take a look at it, see um, what kind of elements they have. The fact maybe maybe they thought okay it served a function, so we can never get it copyrighted because it has a function. Well, now we know that that's not going to be a per se bar anymore based on the wording of this decision. So it's important to look back and see okay do I have anything that could qualify, and if so then file the copyright registration um, because it's important to file a copyright registration if you have any intention of litigating any of those designs in the future. It's a prerequisite to bringing a lawsuit, so you have to do it at that point anyway before you file if you haven't done it. But even, even more important than that is that uh, if you don't do it within a certain amount of time, three months, from when the design is first published, you lose some valuable rights. And in these copyright cases, it's really important to try to get as much of the remedies as you can, including statutory damages and attorney's fees. And you only qualify for those types of damages if you file in a timely way within the period of time prescribed by the copyright statute. So it's really important to go back, see if any, anything qualifies or things coming up um, that haven't been published even better uh, so that you don't have that, that time bar and you can get the most uh, amount of damages that you can. And now, uh, the moment that some of you who are getting CLE credit have been waiting for, I'm going to hand it over to Kayla so she could give you the code for the CLE and you can get your credit for listening to us today. Kayla? Thank you. At this time, I'm going to read the CLE code for this program. If you are in need of CLE credit today, please enter the five-digit code into the poll question on the next screen after it is announced and press the Submit button. The code is as follows, 69C7C. Again, that's 6, 9, C as in cat, 7, C as in cat. Again, if you are seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the polling question by entering the code that was just announced. The polling question will remain open briefly. For those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey credit, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it immediately after the program. A copy of the form can be found in the resource list widget. As a reminder, certificates of attendance will be distributed to eligible participants approximately eight weeks after this webinar. At this time, the poll is now closed. I would like to return the program back to Laura. Okay, thank you. Um, and well, so we're done with the, with the presentation portion just in time. I think we have three minutes left, so maybe 
um, we can take one phone call. Um, I mean, one um, one question if if there is one. Let's see. Are there any questions? Let's see. Okay, so there's been, I think, one question. If if only a portion of the design element were registered, as is done with phantom lines in design patents, would there have been a different result? A different result. You know, that's interesting. Um, I think Justice Ginsburg, really, her entire concurrence is really all about, you know, what was registered with the Copyright Office. And in fact, she, as an appendix, she actually attached the specific, you know, the registration certificates at issue. And she pointed out that in those registration certificates, what's being claimed is like two-dimensional works of art in some instances. In other instances, it says it's a fabric uh, design. So, you know, I, at least maybe for her, it would have been something, something, she just says go by that, and if you just go by that, we don't even have to get here because two-dimensional elements like this are protected. So I don't know if it would have made a difference. I think she was maybe the only one really focused on exactly what was contained in the, uh, in the copyright certificate. Yeah, Lauren, if, if I can just add to that, I mean, I think one of the things that isn't really talked about too much in the decision, but that plays in, that comes into play here is that, you know, what they were claiming is also the 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 exact way that these kind of zigzags and color blocks and stripes are presented. Um, so kind of the the arrangement of those pieces. So obviously, it would be very difficult, it might be very difficult for someone to get a copyright in, you know, one line or one zigzag, but when you put them in a particular fashion, then you might have something that's copyrightable. So if they had excluded certain pieces and said, well, we just want a copyright in the zigzags at the bottom of the at the bottom of this top, um, that might have been more might have been more difficult. Obviously, we don't know whether the copyright office would have issued a registration, um, but I could see that coming into play if they had only tried to claim protection in you know, certain pieces of the design, not the whole design. Um, because like you said, it was, you know, what they what they registered was the drawing of, of what the design was supposed to look like. So um, I just thought that was maybe maybe relevant as well that, you know, it's, it's the way that the stripes and chevrons are presented on the garment, um, not just that they, um, that there is a chevron or is a zigzag that, that Varsity Brands was claiming copyright in. Great. Well, thanks, Julie, and, and thanks, everybody. If there are more questions, here's our contact information. Please make sure to reach out to either one of us, and we could, um, you know, answer as best we can your questions. Also, uh, please note that the uh, these presentation materials and a recording will be available on our website um, in the next few days. So if you want if you want to hear us speak about this again, or if you just want the materials, you know, make sure to go onto our website and check that out. Also, um, you'll be receiving a questionnaire, small survey after the a webinar today. Please fill it out because we'd love to hear from you not only about the contents of this program and and what you liked or didn't, but we really want to hear from you if there's any other topics in the future that you'd like us to cover. You know, we do a lot of these webinars in our fashion industry team, and uh, we'd love to be able to um, address any pressing issues that you as our clients um, have. So please let us know when you fill out that questionnaire. Um, if you have any questions about this program, including the CLE credits, uh, please contact uh, Delia Dye. Um, her name is listed here. Her email address is ddai at foley.com. She can assist you if you need any assistance with CLE. And um, thanks again, everyone, for participating. We hope you enjoyed the session. Have a great afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>